Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and today I'm delighted to be joined not only by Jim Orr, who is familiar to a lot of Axon viewers, but also Des McLean. Welcome to the studio, Des. How are you? It's great to be here. <laughs> uh, instant visual plug. Um, it's fantastic to finally be in Axon Towers and to meet your good self. We were just discussing the last time we spoke was in deepest, darkest lockdown, a few weeks in. Yeah. The scary time of lockdown when you were only allowed to applaud the NHS once a week on a Thursday, and that's the only thing we, we did. But no, that, we'll talk about that today. That was a great podcast. It was brilliant, Des, but you're right. I, I listened back to it just this week. We were in the, the deepest, darkest unknown. We didn't yeah, know what was no, around the corner. Nobody. Uh, not only with uh, the lockdown, but also with Celtic in general, going for 10 in a row. So it's quite refreshing to yeah, hear the positivity in our voices when we were talking about that, Des. We weren't just hopeful, it was a given. We were going, right, when this happens, and then little did we know what was about to unfold with the old COVID and Celtic and everything. It was just mad. So, I can't you guys then, is that what we're saying? We were positive, Jim, but there was no arrogance. Uh, we did have an air of positivity. Quietly confident. Quietly confident. Now, uh, Jim or Talking about positivity, uh, there's lots to be positive about, and as Des says, we are here to talk about Bend It Like Bertie. Uh, we've spoken in the past, Jim, about your um, foray into the world of theatre. Mm -hmm. uh, you're a wordsmith, you're a playwright. A foray, good. Um, talk to us, give us a brief kind of overview of how you got into writing plays and the success so far of your previous plays. Okay, my kind of main hobby for a number of years, about 20 years or so, was uh, taking kids football. And about 2012 or so, it came to kind of an actual conclusion. Uh, kids had taken, left the school, etc. And I'd always quite fancied having to go to writing. Uh, love sitcoms, love comedy, love Des McLean. That, that's, that's obvious. And uh, started to wrote a few sitcoms just for the sake of writing them, just to see how it was done. Did a lot of, re a lot of research on it and what have you. But... You couldn't really take that much forward. I mean, this is just an accountant doing something as a bit of a hobby. So there's no kind of future in that. Not that it was any, that's why I was doing it. I mean, it was good fun doing it and a bit of a laugh doing it. And I've been to see a few plays, a few Celtic plays, and that got me mm. thinking, could I write a play? I'll have a go at that. And uh, this is this 2014 then, and Lisbon 50th anniversary was coming up in three years' time. I thought, I'll write a play about Lisbon. And then I thought, Ach, everyone will write plays about Lisbon because the people who know what they're doing will do this. And I thought, what else could I write about? And I wrote a lot of research about 1967. And there was a famous Scotland match, Scotland beat England 3-2 at Wembley in 1967. And I'm a big Scotland fan as well, as I've, as I've said in the podcast. So I thought, I'll write about that. Because uh, 67 was, was a phenomenal year, socially, politically, musically. Mm. And it was the high watermark Scottish football. Because as well as Lisbon, Rangers lost the Cup Winners' Cup final. Kilmarnock lost the first Cup semi-final. The first Cup is what's now the Europa League. Dundee United beat Barcelona, home and away. Uh, Scottish football was a real high watermark. Scotland went Wembley and won 3 2. And I said, I said in the podcast the other week about I don't look at Scotland, England as a big game anymore. Back then it was a big game because mm -hmm. we, we could mm -hmm. easily hold our own. So anyway, I'll write a play about that because it's such a kind of fascinating time. Write a play about that. Nobody's interested. Why would they be interested in an accountant writing a play? So my sister is in the business. She's a singer, actress. So she passed it around a number of people who thought it who all thought it was very good, not kind of like very good for an accountant, but very good. So we did nothing 2015, 2016, and 2017 was going to be the anniversary, the 50th anniversary. And I went to see something called The Lions of Lisbon, uh, which was a play written by Ian Old, yes. the old's older brother, and Professor yep. Wally Maley. And it was brought out uh, for the 25th anniversary of Lisbon, and he brought it out again for the 50th anniversary. It's on the and more. And I'd never seen something like this before, and it was called a rehearsed reading, which was completely new to me. Because look at the cost of putting things on yourself, and it's going to cost a fortune to put a thing on the set, the costumes, weeks of rehearsals. And you're talking, you know, you know, well into five figures, basically. Uh, and I thought, I'd like to do this, but not to that level. But when I saw this rehearsed reading, it was like 10 people on stage, T-shirts and jeans, and it was their turn to speak. They'd the script in their hand, and they would stand up, and they would do the line, and then they would sit down again. And it looked bizarre for the first five minutes. But after the first five minutes, you forget all about that. And you realise, well, that's the cop. And that's the wee Ned there. And, so and it was brilliant. Really, really good. The play was great as well. But you're thinking, how much would it cost to put something like this on? So you went and find out that. And it cost a few grand, but I'd been doing this for three years. So it was either do it now or don't do it at all. So I thought, I'll have a go at this. So rehearse reading. And what you actually find out is that because actors, you know, 90% of actors don't work. 
you know, there's, there's no jobs. So actually, you could hire actors who are like top, top actors. You know, guys are in River City and Target and all this kind of stuff. So through my sister's connections, I end up getting five actors. So I'm like hiring actors. I'm hiring a theatre. I'm designing a poster. I'm kind of doing the whole thing. You know, one of the actors was the guy called Matt Costello, who plays Stevie the Bookie. And uh, still game. And you're thinking, I've got Stevie the Bookie. This is, this is great. And we do a couple of days rehearsal because when you do this rehearsal reading, they've got the script. If it wasn't a rehearsal reading, you would have to then do two weeks rehearsals. That adds to the cost, etc. So you can do a rehearsal in a couple of days. And the director's there called Jimmy Chisholm, who's in River City just now, who's a phenomenal actor, an unbelievable actor. And I thought we'd be doing this, you know, five people stand up with jeans and t-shirts. But he made a play and they acted it. So basically we'd got tables and chairs and I brought in kind of jackets and flat caps and tartan scarves and lion rampants and all this kind of stuff. And what you would then see, we'd end act, this act here, the guys move the chairs here and and, and that's going to be a, 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 an old style train. So you want to sit between each other and do this. And then Jim, you got a bag, bring the bag in because, and then, so it became a play without the props and with the limited costumes and they've got the scripts and basically. So it became something much, much bigger than I thought it was going to be. And I hired a theatre for one night because that's all I could afford. And I basically contacted everyone I've ever known, ever. So people I was at school like 40 years ago, you'd found through LinkedIn or Facebook and you say, I've not seen you for 40 years, how are you doing? I've written a play, I want to come and see it. So we managed to kind of just about sell out. So it maybe cost about three grand to put on, you get a grand back, cost two grand, which makes it a lot of money, which has a lot of money. But this is over a three year period. And this was your main hobby. And it was easily the best thing I'd ever done. You know, to actually watch this thing. I made videos between scenes and stuff and I'm controlling the videos and doing all that kind of stuff as well. And all this stuff is taking place in the audience. Within 20 seconds, the audience has this huge laugh. And you think, well, they've laughed straight at the start. This is good. And it was brilliant. And I'd taped it as well. So I got this kind of thing. That, and I watched it from time to time. And you think, you did that yourself. You went from nothing to doing that. So having done that, that gave me the confidence. Do the Celtic play next. And I'd, obviously, you've got a ton of potential Celtic plays that you could do about a time and period. You know, not, not about a person, but about a time and period. And I thought, stopping the 10, I know it's not a good thing to say this now, but stopping the 10 back in 97, 98, huge moment, mm. absolutely huge moment. When you think about the big moments in Celtic's history, that's up there, because the Lisbon Lions record to be broken, that's a disaster, you know. And there's a line in the play talking about, you know, if they were to do that, they'd be ripping the piss at you, no for a week, no for a month, no for a year, but for all eternity, or all swear word eternity. So it's a huge thing. And from a play point of view, the season was up and down, we're ahead, they're ahead, all this kind of stuff. So from a dramatic point of view, it was going to be big. So I wrote this play anyway. Uh, and because I called the Wembley play Bend It Like Baxter, I thought I'll call it Bend It Like Something Else. What will I call it? Bend It Like What? Because my mates were always saying, no, no, you want to call it Cheerio 10 in a row and smell the love. And I'm not a big fan of that triumphal stuff. So I thought, no, I'm going to Bend It like, bend like Larson. No, that's too obvious. And then you think, well, when was the moment we knew we'd stop to 10? It's when Harold scored the goal. Mm. And from an alliteration point of view, ideal. Ben Lillard brought back. Brilliant. And it wasn't a player that Harold brought back. In the same way that Ben Lillard Bertie is not a player but Bertie Old. Harold's mentioned in the play in pretty disparaging terms most of the time. Couldn't accuse us with a banjo, that kind of stuff. So I like the play. And uh, three of the cast who were in Baxter were meant to be in it. But they ended up doing different things. So with two months to go, I had no cast. And uh, I'd seen James McInerney. And, and a few things. My sister knew him, and I contacted James, and uh, so he's been reading the script. And obviously, this is a random person who's got no background at all sending a script. And James said, "All right, I'll, I'll look at it." And he did look at it. He loved it. This is brilliant. We, we, we must do this. And I said, "We need another two members of the cast." And you got Laurie Venti, who's a phenomenal actor. Uh, another thing about two guys, they're, they're mad Celtic fans, and the three people I had lined up weren't mad Celtic fans. And we got someone else, a girl called Carmen. Pierrocini, mm. and uh, we do two nights this time, and it kind of washes its face financially. But the reaction was like ridiculous, uh, and part of that was to do with Axel, because you asked me on a podcast uh, to talk about Ben like Brad, but bit more about a supporters campaign called Save Ourselves that was involved in 30 years ago. But, but, but having been on your programme, <laughs> people started following me on Twitter, so I had like two followers that became like 102 followers overnight, and it was people like Matt McGlone were following me and Tommy Sheridan, guys who had large followings, Joe McHugh video sales, etc. So then, when I tweeted something about the play, they all retweeted it, mm -hmm. and then suddenly you realise the power of Twitter that goes out there. So we sold out two nights, no bother, but the reaction to it was, was phenomenal, just unbelievable. Uh, so we had to do it, the guy said we need to do this again, but do it as a proper play. 
So we do five nights at Webster's, maybe six months later than that. Sells out, no bother. And then James had asked a number of people to come along just to see it. Kind of guys with a little bit of money who could maybe take it forward. The next thing I know, we're on the SEC. Playing the SEC, five performances, sold out. So that's where I've kind of came from. From this kind of, it's a bit of a hobby to the surreal <laughs> standing in the SEC with all these security guards asking me, is it okay if I do this? No, okay if I do that? I on you go, pal. That's fine. And the reaction, and people came to see it, people like Mark Miller uh, came to see it and said, it's, it's the funniest thing he's ever seen on the Scottish stage. So you went from writing a wee daft story, which which you think is a wee daft story, to putting this thing on. And Laurie Vency, who's, as I said, a phenomenal actor, uh, been in tons and tons of things throughout his life, including gangs in New York, mm. says one of the most challenging things I've ever done. Is I mean, he was right? phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal on it. So the plan is basically, could, could, could I write a Celtic play every year? And if I thought it was good enough, have a go at putting it on, but when you put it on, you put it on as a rehearsed reading, taking a test it out. Baxter was a night, Brat Back was a couple of nights, Bertie will be three nights. Uh, and I've been extremely fortunate to get to get Des McLean to be involved in this uh, this production. So that's my wee story of how I got to here. That's a nice bridge back to Des as well, Mr. Jim. McLean. Well done. Could I just ask, I'll edit this wee bit out, could you pull your chair Which way? on your right hand side so that you're more okay. in line? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> just from a visual aspect, that's all. Okay. Des McLean. Could you do it again? Sorry, it's just as soon as you, you go back, you're behind the mic. Okay. Just come forward a wee bit, Jim. Well, I know you're a perfectionist and you'll pick up on this. And just pull that, just that'll do. No, no, too sorry. Aye. Further back. Just right in front of the camera. Okay. It's just it's, it's, the mic will always pick you up. Right. The mic will always pick you up. Even though you're speaking in a different direction, I'll be picking up just there you go. Jim, we can't have this in those three phrase. Okay. And Des McLean. Wouldn't you wouldn't you agree, Jim? Uh, Des. Yeah, and see when I was looking around at Jim there when he was when he was talking. Um did I look okay on there? Just looking around at him. Oh I look fine just because he was he was speaking hundred percent for about twenty five minutes. I like that. I like I know what <laughs> I had to do like all that. The fact that he's now allowing you to speak this. You can tell he never got a word in the motor, can you? <laughs> now, one thing that Jim did say that I always ask people that are in the arts, um, musicians and, you know, actors mm. and comedians, is Jim managed to get people in the roles who were Celtic fans. Yeah. But when you look at the amount of talent out there, you know, authors and musicians and actors and comedians, the amount... Celtic fans that are in amongst the arts, it's quite incredible, Des. It's because we're all just creative geniuses. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is staggering. Best answer. It, yeah, well, uh, you look at comedy, Connolly, Frankie Boyle, Kevin Bridges, you just go through. We were doing a, a, a thing about, it was all the Celtic fan comedians versus Rangers fans, and there was like, there was just a couple of Rangers fans versus about 70 odd and we thought that's not going to be fair. Uh, yes, it is. It's amazing the, the amount of creative people, as you, you've just mentioned there. And uh, what I noticed, as you said, the cast for the Bend at Le Bag, it was all, they were all mad Celtic fans as well. So I think that helped. You can see that in Laurie's face that he was going through every emotion of that that mad season, stopping the 10. And yes, uh, it's, another, it's another Celtic fan in this row, and I think the rest of the cast are going to be for this as well, eh? Yep. <laughs> yep, he says. So. And, and there's the passion. Jim's already mentioned two things. He's mentioned 1967, and he's mentioned stopping the 10. Now, I was born in 78, but growing up as a Celtic fan days, one of the first things you learn is that team. Simpson, Craig, Gemmel, Murdoch, McNeil, Clark, Johnson, Wallace, Chambers, mm -hmm. Alden, Lennox, and it rolls off the tongue like the alphabet. You know, it's one of these... Moments in time mm -hmm. that no matter what era you are from, it's so important to the history of Celtic Football Club for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and now you're playing a member of that Lisbon Lions team. Talk to me about your relationship with the Lions, what they mean to you. Well, not just uh, a member of the team and not just, this is going to get put up here every, no, <laughs> not, not just a member. I think I can say without a shadow of a doubt, the greatest living cell, right? And the most entertaining and a guy who's got a heart of gold. I'm lucky enough, I met Bertie Old um, many times at functions, and I'm talking about functions from the Ranza Bar in Black Hill, right? We were doing a wee charity night there, and he stole the show. He's a natural entertainer. When you see him telling stories and gags, he does look like a comedian, a stand-up, a performer. 
and uh, and he has he'll stop and talk to anybody. If you met him in the street, he'd, he'd stand and blather away. He's, he's just he's one of these guys. He's got time for everybody. But I I was lucky enough to meet be on with him many times. You know, you on the night, son? Are you the turn I? Magnificent, brilliant. No, right, what will do it? And it was just he was a natural. But the best time was we were in Vegas. I was in Vegas entertaining the, the Celtic fans for the convention over there. And Bertie, the next day, it, it was it was fantastic. Bertie was standing we kind of lag at the swim pool. That last night, son, was magnificent. See, when you were up there doing your stuff, your Billy Connolly, your Stallo, all that stuff, and it was magnificent. And I'm sitting there going, this is a, this all has been lying. This is like my dad's hero. This is our hero. This this a legend, a living legend, and, the, you know, one of the greatest ever ambassadors for Celtic, right? He is. And he's telling me, you know, that I, I was magnificent up there. That's, that's not a bad review. So then I'm on the plane, and I'm saying to Jim, usually when you're on a plane, you're like, what am I going to do? I'll watch that movie. I'll read this book. I want to... I didn't want this plane journey to end. Bertie was sitting next to me for 10 hours telling me all these stories about we Jinky and Mr. McGrory. Jimmy McGrory was standing there, right? And he said, he says, Robert, because that's what he was like. He called me Robert. <laughs> and he said, he had a camel coat on, Slater's magnificent, immaculate man. And he said to me, he says, listen, Robert, have you ever seen a new twenty pound note? I said, Mister McGrory, I've never seen an old one. <laughs> That's what it was like, you know. So he's telling me all these stories, and I'm sitting there, and and, and they were I, honestly, it flew by, and I'm thinking, little did I know that I'm going to be playing them. I mean, it's not the Bertie old story, but it is a tribute. It's not, it is a tribute to Bertie in many ways, and uh, and it's it's fantastic. It, it's it's a roller coaster. Of uh, an emotional roller coaster for any Celtic fan, young or old. Is that a good plug, Jim? Good man, that's it. From from a wee a wee trendy hipster to to you know to your to your father, whatever. No, but it is, and, and to to of I'm thinking of all the Lisbon lines, he is the one. If somebody says who do you, maybe Bertie, you know, because he, he's he's the, he's got the part, he's got mm -hmm. the personality, he's got the but, and he's genuinely a funny, warm guy. And if you if you met him now. You wouldn't get a word done, you know. Might remind you someday. So um, <laughs> no, no. So we went along to meet him, didn't we? Last year, we met him last, last year. year, and it was uh, just before lockdown. I we sat. Okay, I went on, but I went, I went, I went, I'll just sit here. We came through in the car together. You can tell we never get a word done. So we went through, and I'll, I'll hand over to Jim, and we met the great man. And Jim, you tell. I've told you about my ten hours with him, how amazing that was, and you a special ten minutes with him. A special ten minutes. You've been. Uh, we met Bertie last September, August, mm. September, something like that. Anyway, uh, there's uh, spoke to Robert. Robert's the loveliest guy in the world. Yeah. And uh, we go along, and you're thinking, I'm going to meet Bertie all. I've never met Bertie all before. Obviously, Dave has met him before. And we walk in, and it's like, it's like, he's like just like your long lost son. I can't do the voice, but it's like, Jim, Jim, can we? Oh, I've been looking forward to meeting you, son. It's great to see you. And come in here. What are you drinking? Oh, it's, it's just long lost pal. And uh, we spent the best part of it an hour and a half uh, with Bertie and Robert, and it was absolutely brilliant. And uh, because I've written the play, I was kind of doing a lot, a lot of the kind of chat and thinking doing this bit. Like, oh, that sounds brilliant, son, and that sounds great, son. And, and it was just a brilliant, you know, hour and a half. Couldn't believe we were sitting with Bertie old. And then there was a bit where his son had to go in and pick up his wife, and and Des had to make a phone call, and it's just me and Bertie old, and you're sitting. It's just you and Bertie old. And one of the things. And it's just quite coincidental the way things have worked out. Is I'm involved in something called football memories, where before COVID, I, I go to a care home once a week, mm -hmm. and uh, I chat to some residents who've got dementia, and you use football cards uh, to try and spark some memories from them. And some are just blank, and some get a wee spark, and all of a sudden, you know, show them a picture of Jimmy Johnson. It's oh, we jinky this, and then they'll. All of a sudden, it's oh, I used to think thinking that pub before the game and stuff, and all of a sudden, it just sparks a memory. So, so I was explaining to Bertie about football memories and the fact that you know, a pound from every ticket is going to go towards football memories. They do something called a, a memory box about 250 quid, whereby in the memory box there's an old style football and there's the old style boots with the kind of with the cork studs in it, yeah. and then there's Bovro and this kind of stuff. So, the plan is hopefully we can raise a bit of money uh, towards buying a few boxes, uh, so it's another benefit. Of the play, and I had the cards with me, uh, which I've got just now. <laughs> and uh, so it's quite surreal. I mean, I'm sitting with Bertie Old, right? And so I'll ask you the cards here, Bertie, and I say, How it works is like this, you know, and it goes like that. I said, Do you remember him? So I show him off a picture of himself, and like Des was saying, the stand up comedy, and says, Oh, he was magnificent. He was uh, <laughs> handsome. 
handsome man as well. What a player he was. And I'm going to throw out the cards, Jimmy Johnson, Jinky, and Charlie Tuck, and those kind of thing. And then we get to some people who he played against. Oh, he was a dirty big so and so. And this is totally surreal. This yeah. is like the highlight, they like a 10 minute highlight. I mean, COVID was 2020 was, was like this this uh, horrible year, but I had 10 minutes, 15 minutes with me and just Bertie Old, a Lisbon line, and I'm showing him cards of the time he played, and he's been dead funny. And then he had to come back. There's no thing to come back, spoiler. And then, and then Robert came back as well. I had to put my cards away, and that was it finished. So uh, it was great meeting him. It was unbelievable meeting him. And then I had done some kind of, I did a week in a Mickey Mouse, put on Mickey Mouse, <laughs> a poster that wasn't that good, coming soon type of thing, which I'd done just for the day. And then Bertie posed with it. And he looked a million dollars, looked absolutely brilliant. He uh, looked fantastic. He was tanned, and, it's like, and, and nothing was too much trouble for him. And, uh, and we explained the play. Because the, the, the point of meeting him was that, I mean, if all of a sudden you've got a play getting advertised, Ben like Bertie and maybe his family's thinking, so this yeah. about, So I think we, I said to Des, we need to meet Bertie. And because Des knows everyone, Des managed to organise a meeting with Bertie. So we go and see, see Bertie. And we explained that it's not the Bertie old story. I mean, there's a there's a, there's a play, Davy Caswell's got Tommy Burns story coming up in November, I think. And that'll be the Tommy Burns story. And there'll be laughter and tears. He said, there'll be laughter and tears in this one as well. But, it, but it's not the Bertie old story. The, the, the story is set in uh, January to April 1965, the Scottish Cup run, uh, then, and that was the kind of launch pad for the Lisbon Lions. You you then said the, the kind of famous Lisbon Lions team and, and, and how this starts off without giving anything away. It's a, the main story is about a kind of middle-aged woman. She's, she's, she's the main focus, mad Celtic fan, and her dads get the early onset of dementia. Uh, and at the start, near the start, he hears what the name John Fallon, he just wraps into Fallon John Gemmo, mother of Neil Clark. And he he rhymes off the sixty five team like that, you know, and then it, it kind of kicks off from there. Mm -hmm. So so Bertie comes in now and again, you know, and I've said to Des in the way here, I said if you explain it without giving anything away, if you imagined there was the the next James Bond movie and Bertie was in it <laughs> and it was like double O ten thirty, that's what it's like. He can he comes in and out type of thing because what, what I didn't want to do was just have like just solid Bertie all because yep. less is more. Mm -hmm. And this kind of stuff. So there's a wee tribute in it somewhere. Uh, the wee Desi there, something like that. And, that, and that, and that's the Bertie bit. And then after that, he's kind of in and out, and in and out. And he's in. He's, 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 he's Des is brilliant, absolutely. When he's in, because we've we've done a few read throughs <laughs> via Zoom. You know, yeah, <laughs> via Zoom. Yeah. I can't get through the scenes because once he puts the voice on, you just that's it. And we're, we're chatting this coming through, and and and, and Des was talking about. Uh, how we actually met with this one, is that worth telling? Is, I, uh, I, yeah. I, I spoke too much. <laughs> <laughs> Your brother, is that okay to tell that story? Yes. Uh, there you go. So basically, we put Brat back on, and uh, I'd seen Des before in stand up, and I liked what he did. I oh, love what he does, and I knew he was a mad Celtic fan. So the other great thing is when you when you run things yourself, you control everything. So you hand out comps here and everywhere. You can come, you can come. See, with the SEC, they only give us four comps. Like, mad. But when I'm in charge, I, I can dish out comps. Like, you, who are you? I like you, John Paul. John, like, you get that. Kevin Graham, you'll see. So I'm, I'm giving out all this. I contacted his Des via Facebook. And I said, I, I know you're a big Celtic fan. We've got this play. Can we be fans coming along? And he said, oh, I'd love to join, but I've got a gig that night. Would it be okay if my brother came along? I said, ah, of course, they bother. Frank's his name. Like, fine. So Frank McLean comes along. And uh, the next day after that, I got a phone call for the theatre. He said, you know Frank McLean? I'm thinking... <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm thinking, who, who's, who's Frank? I said, why, aye, aye. <clears throat> Des McLean's brother, aye, 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 I don't know him, but I know I love him. He said, well, uh, well, you see last night, uh, he had a meal and a few drinks and didn't he pay? You off his mark, <laughs> like, So obviously he must have thought, we've well, got a comp ticket, it's like an all eat booth that you can drink. <laughs> just, just go for it. And I said, it's okay, I'll, 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 I'll sort that out. So I spoke to Des and he was mortified, obviously thinking, you know, the good name of McLean's been dismissed. <laughs> I'll sort out Jim Nabo. So that's how we kind of first get in contact. And two months later, out of the blue desk contacts me and he says, uh, I've been asked to be in a play about a gambling addict. Would you like to write it? So this is like completely out of the blue. And I said, well, why would you ask me that? And he said, well, that daft brother of mine, all he's been talking about the last two months is Ben and Bratback and how funny it is. And obviously this is, mm -hmm. I'd like you to do this. So, so we met, and we met with a guy who was based on this uh, yeah. gambling addict. And it's just a harrowing story, mm -hmm. this guy, mm -hmm. you know. And and I do this for fun. You know, it's, 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 it's really good fun sitting there on your Todd making up daft stories, trying to make yourself laugh, but a gambling addict. And they always say you should write what you know. I don't know about gambling, I don't know about a gambling addict. But I read a book about 10 years ago called Yes Man, made into a film. Jim Carrey was in it. And the book's with Danny Wallace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. it's yeah. the funniest book you'll ever <clears throat> read. 
uh, and it's basically about a guy who is in a rut, doesn't want to do anything. Funny, funny book, much better than the film. But it turns his life around because he's in this rut and all of a sudden he starts saying yes to everything. No matter what it is, he says yes to everything. So I thought, from 10 years ago, I've, I've said yes to everything. So when Paul John Dyke says, fans going on the podcast, yes. <laughs> you sure? Yes. I'll go on that. So Gambon added, yes, of course, why would you <laughs> do that? So we meet with the with the guy and his story's harrowing, wasn't it? It was oh, a harrowing, was... harrowing story. And I'm sitting there thinking, but he wanted to be a comedy. Mm. Right, and Des would do the voices, and I read this. I said, it's comedy. So we meet with the guy, and, and I'm thinking, how do you make this a comedy? It's a serious issue. And the stories he was telling about, you know, he, he lost his house, oh, he's an alcoholic, and yeah. his son died. It was, it was just harrowing, harrowing story. So I got away, and I said, well, we left me, and I'll go and think about it. And then we met again. I said, here's my idea. Bend it like Brendan. Right, right. So it's basically, uh, and I don't have any poster for it. Like, and it was a picture of the Brendan Rogers, and he's got an angel on one uh, shoulder and a devil in the other. And the tagline was the old Beatles, Let It Be So. And it was, uh, when I find myself in times of trouble, Brendan Rogers speaks to me, so it's time to bend up like Brendan. So the idea was that basically the guy, every night he wakes up, and Brendan Rogers, which is Des McLean. So we meet the guy again, and he loves this idea, doesn't he? He loves this idea, bend up like Brendan. Yeah, it's going to be great. It's about the invincible season. And I, and I, and I pitched this thing, and I'm showing this daft poster I've made up. And Des does his voice, does, does all the bread and stuff. And the guy loves it. And I said, but my idea is it's maybe about 80% comedy, madcap comedy, and maybe 20% serious. I have no idea how I'm going to make it serious. But, but we want to get a message across that like, like gambling is bad and all mm. that. So, you know. so, so that's how it was left. And I go away, and, and, I'm, and I'm writing Ben like Bertie at the time. I said, we'll have to do this one next, Ben like Brendan. And then the guy sends me an email, and he says, I'm really looking forward to this, Jim. It's great, great to meet you in days, and it'll be good, really good fun and stuff like this, you know. And we put it on an Oren Moore in the West End and stuff like this, and that fine thing. And he attacked something with it, and he said, I hope you don't mind. He said, I've written something myself. Yeah. Uh, 20 pages of stuff. And I'd love to know what you thought of it. I need water. So I read this thing, and I was almost in tears. Absolutely harrowing, harrowing. Uh, so really well written, you know. And to give you a kind of quick example of some of the stuff, uh, his big addiction is called Fob T. He's fixed off his betting terminals that are in the bookies. It's like a buggy machine. He's yeah. a taxi driver. He would go in the taxi round, earn a couple hundred quid, and lose it in two minutes. Basically, that's in these machines. And then this thing that they have written, he tells a story about, and one day he goes in, and he's up, and he's up, and he's two or three grand up, and he's talking about all the stuff he's going to do with his two or three grand. He's going to sell these loan sharks. He's going to do this kind of stuff. But he keeps on going. He you knows what's going to happen next. If he keeps on going, he's going to start losing it. And that's what happens. And he's standing there and he says, I need a piss, but I'm not going to leave here. So I just piss where I'm standing. And I'm stinking of urine and stuff like this. And he faints at the end of it. And I'm really reading this stuff and you're thinking, that's the end of Brendan and Brendan. There's no way you can do this. And I contacted the guy and I said, look, it's brilliantly written. Brilliantly written. You've got a story to tell. And Oren Moore in the trendy West End, Ben like Brendan, that's really no way forward. And he no. was saying, no, no, I love this. It's great. Brendan and Des will do the voices. So we to convince him we had to meet him. And then we over it again. And I said, look, what you really want to do with this is take it to people that will make a difference. Yeah. Take it to Berlini, take it to yeah, young offenders' homes. He's now doing a prison tour. And he's not doing a prison which tour. Which he is, which is, where, which which is, is perfect. Which is exactly where it should be. That's, what, that's the fact, and that's the fact for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. so we, so we do that, and we met, and he was, and he was really, he was really so disappointed. Wasn't oh, no. He? oh no, I love this like, Brendan. Brendan. And I wanted Des McLean doing Des. plunge McNugget. No, this, so <laughs> chalk a bit, chalk a bit. <laughs> so we met in a cafe in East End, and it was so, so, so we read the cafe, and, and the guy parked over there, and Des was parked kind of near me. And he then says to me, he says, oh, I'd love to have done that, mind. He said, on my bucket list. He said, on my bucket list, I need to do a Celtic play. I need to, so if you write another Celtic play, Jim, can you consider me? And I'm thinking, of course I'd consider you. So I said, in fact, I'm writing something called Ben and Bertie just now. I said, it's about nearly finished the first draft of this. Uh, I'll maybe give you a shout and let you see it sometime. I right, fine. So I get home. <laughs> and there's a, a missed call. And it's, and it's Mr. McLean. So I phoned him back, and in the next five minutes, it was just this Bertie Alden impersonation, just total, full-on Bertie impersonation. And that planted a wee seed, because basically the play was about this. And if Des McLean was in it, that would be great having Des McLean in it. But you could put Bertie in the play now, actually having a character. As I said, like if it was a James Bond and he's 00030, it'd be something like that. And that would raise it to a whole new level. And that's and that's how it started, wasn't it? Well, the, the love affair started. That's the love it. affair started then, and but the moment that when I finally 
the moment when when uh, I the nail in the the coffin for me, well, uh, is when the the wee light bulb came up. Is when I left the the play in the uh, well cabaret the very last night that you ran Bendit Liberty, and I just thought uh, Bendit ben Liberty. I told you I'm full on Bendit Liberty. It's operation Bendit Liberty. Everything's Bendit Liberty. <laughs> when when I was at Bendit Liberty back with my wife who knows nothing about football, she's not interested. And at the, at the end of that, and watching the the play, which was magnificent, as Bertie would say, and I left it and I said to my wife, I want to be in a Celtic play. That was absolutely tremendous. And the reaction at the end and everybody, it was just a, a brilliant thing. It was amazing. And uh, you've seen it yourself. That was, it was just non-stop. Uh, ben Little Brat back. And I thought, well, something like this. And then when he told me he was doing this, I just, uh, I just went into Bertie mode and I felt back to that time you know, all the times, as I say, from the Rans and Black Hill mm -hmm. to the Hilton Hotel, all these times with Bertie, and suddenly I just went into Bertie mode. And, and remember, I'm getting a one-to-one -one on the plane. The bold Bertie's sitting there giving it all that, you know. And you know better than I do, son. I was standing there. I was standing there in the tunnel at Lisbon. Stand, sand Romazola. They were like film stars. Teeth were white. Their teeth were white. <laughs> Ronnie Simpson, he had his teeth in his bonnet. He just tasting his bonnet, and I thought, "Hey, that's what Jim Craig's done work on the, on his teeth there." That's what I'm saying, son. And I stood there and I looked at Mazzola, Sandro Mazzola, the whole lot of them. It was like Hollywood lined up. They were film stars. And I looked at Big Bully Caesar. He was magnificent. And they looked down at us, and I stood, and I looked at them, and that's when I went, "Hail!" Hail and seeing we do that, we know that the place is going to erupt when it so it starts off with a few Bertieisms, a few iconic Bertie moments. So there is a tribute That's to Bertie at the start, at the start yeah. and then we yeah. get into the, the nitty gritty of the the, 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 the play, and then Bertie appears all the way through it, Funny right song. up to the very end. So it's there's a lot of Bertie in it, but me doing Bertie, a tribute to Bertie. Funny thing is it is it the more you listen to Bertie, you know, you realise all the things that he does to make people feel at home. And some of the words that he used in that, we said that one there, that you know this better than me. So he, he's talking to Jerry McCulloch about being a son of a husband, <laughs> and he's saying, oh, Jerry, you know this better than me. <laughs> but no, does not he? All the interviews he's saying, and he always goes, and you, you, you know, you, you know, and you know as well as I do, and you know, and I know, but you know better than me, and I promise you, I promise you, son, right now, that's the thing, you've got a good setup in here, son, Axom. It's magnificent what you're doing. It's magnificent what you're doing. What you're doing, you're, it's, it's the digital age, son. The digital <laughs> age. This is great. In my days, it was new. And he, and he, he knows, he's, he's passionate. He, and he, every every syllable is a prisoner. And, and he, it's just like every detail. He'll get in, and he, he, as I say, McGrory, Camel Coat, Slaters, Immaculate. That's the thing. People like him, you know, back in the... And he'd, he'd, he'd a bun it on, it was a tweed, everything, attention to detail is just staggering. It's also such a talent that it puts you at ease, that bit about you know better than me. I mean, this is a Lisbon live. I know, I know. The European Cup, and he's, and he's dead humble. You know, you know better than me. You know as well as I do. You know, you, you, you know better than me. And he'll, he'll say it as if you should, and you're kind of going, what? And, and he's making it as if he's, you know, this guy's up there, you know, like, like iconic, you know. See that moment in the tunnel, right? It's it's part of this Celtic fairy tale, and it's cinematic, right? Now you're mentioning there, looking at the Inter Milan players, and they look like film stars. Jim, show us that picture of Bertie again. Put it up on the camera up here. Oh. Now, I watch a lot of the old gangster movies, Des, right? See, when I'm watching them, that's the type of guy I'm thinking about. I'm thinking mm. of the Celtic team yeah. in the 1960s, mm. the way they wear their hair, they were immaculately dressed. Yeah. They looked like gangsters. What did I say to you there? I mean, Bertie could be in any Scorsese film, just sitting there, you know, like, hey, you know, uh, you know, this guy, the Scotsman, you know, uh, Mr. You know, and Bertie sitting there going, I'll tell you something, pal. <laughs> right? You know better than I do, De Niro, right? You might be Italian. You might be Italian, just like Sandro Mazzola. But let me tell you something else. I will make you an offer that you couldn't refuse, son. You couldn't refuse this offer. Funny. I'm funny how, eh? <laughs> funny how? Eh, this guy, you know, he's he, he funny. You, 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 what, in what way am I funny? You know, the, this guy, you know, he's a lion. You know, he, he's a Lisbon lion, you know? What the fuck do you mean he's a lion? A lion? What kind of fucking lion? He's a lion, you know, he, he's like a Lisbon lion. 
You know better than me. You know better than, than I do, guys, right? You, you guys, you, you might be good fellas, right? But see, back in the day, me and Jinky, I'd make you an offer. You couldn't refuse it, son. You couldn't refuse this offer. Horses seed in your bed. I'll tell you one better than that. I'll, what the fuck? What? A lion? What? What the fuck? He's a lion? What the fuck? What the fuck do you mean he's a lion? Listen, son. It was magnificent, son, right? I'll make you an offer you couldn't refuse. Simple as that. He had a camel coat on, immaculate, out of slaters. Slaters? What the fuck is sl Cam Camel coat, just to... See, mm. see Big McGrory, Jimmy McGrory, lovely man. He said to me, he said, he's a... He, you know, he, he's, a, he's a fucking lion. You know, he's a, he's, a, he's a lion, you know what the... What the fuck do you mean lion? What the fuck do you mean? Lion, lion how? What the fuck? Lion, you're a lion fucking goddamn bitch. I'll tell you, you know better than I do, son. I'm fucking lying. Don't make me angry, son, okay? I'll make you an offer. You couldn't refuse it, son. Couldn't refuse it. Me and Big Bully, Caesar. Hey, he's a lion. You could see Bertie sitting there, that you know, the Scotsman, never mind the Irishman, just sitting there <laughs> with the wee, you know, the, 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 the teeth, not the pure go, uh, get the wee game kind of grin on that. I'll make you an offer you couldn't refuse. The son. Scotsman, that's you know what the Scotsman that's starring Bertie old. <laughs> and everyone would love him. Oh, would love him. Like, he was yeah, a gangster, they would love him. But when you honestly, when you meet him, he ah, does do that. Ah. The wee, it's always the wee, all right, son, the wee, the wee touch of him, right? Aye, and that's and as you say, those little you know as well as Addy. How would you know about, about the tunnel and, and what he's done and where he's been and all that? You know, and, and he, it's just and such he's lived a, this, this fantastic life, an amazing life. Yeah, you know, I've said before, the footballers are ordinary people who have lived extraordinary lives, yes. mm -hmm. and and he has led one of the most extraordinary lives, and he's really really humble with it, and that that ability to put people at ease that's 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 a real skill. And you've also said as well that he could easily be in a stand-up comic because his timing is... His timing, is, and he does look like you're kind of a, you know, 70s, eight, you know that. And and I'll tell you another thing, and even when you see him in, in a, down in... When you see him in the, you know, in, in, in uh, Baird's Bar and you see Jinky and Dixie Dean's on that, they all know he's the man. They all know he's the man with the stories now. They're all kind of, you know, sitting back and, he, and he's up there. And, he, and big, tiny Morton, you know, and that says... If I thought you, you know, and you, they all know what's coming. They've all heard the stories. And it, it, he's got the natural. You could tell great pattern merchant. But you're right about the gangster thing. You could see him sitting there, you know, the Scotsman sitting there. And you have to go and see Mr. All, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what is it you want, son? I've warned you. I've warned you before. And you know better than I do. That's your last chance. It's his last chance, son. Don't call me there. I can't agree on that. Don't call me there. That's it. <laughs> so, funny how. So, but, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a clown. Right, so, no, no, you're right. That We were just talking about that. The, 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 the immaculate legit, yeah. When he signed for you Birmingham as well, he, he's walking down yeah. the road, yeah. you know, the suit on. Like, he, he could be walking along with the craze, couldn't he? Yeah. Oh, yeah. it's brilliant. But again, just that image, Jim, has sparked that conversation. Yes, yeah, so show some of the other um, curio that you brought along and well, what, do what is, you do with this. Well, what I do, basically, is that one of the fascinating things I have is the fact that when we did Brat Back, I was at the games. You know, so I've got memory of that. I don't remember 65 at all, too young. But uh, I, met, I met a lovely man called Jim Jim Divers uh, via, via Declan McConville. Because one of my ideas was, the first idea I had is do the, do, do the whole play on a supporters bus. Right? They're going to a game, they're coming back from the game. That was the original idea. But I thought you need to get people moving about rather than have that. But the main male character is the convener of a supporters bus back in 65. And my big idea was, could I find somebody who got on a Celtic supporters bus in 65? And I exceeded the expectations because Declan comes back and says, there's a guy called Jim Divers. He was a convener of the Shakespeare bus back in the 60s. So Declan and I met Jim Divers. Lovely guy. Spent the best part of two hours with him. He gave me photocopies of old Celtic supporters association uh, convention meeting, whatever you call them. His memory was great. He was talking about going to Aberdeen before there was motorways and meeting me up pieces and selling the pieces to people on the bus and stuff like that. So we actually were talking to somebody who was on. So so the Shakespeare, so, so then you think, well, that's in the play, basically. The main character is going to be the convener of the Shakespeare bus type of thing, you know. So meeting somebody like that with that kind of history is great. So what other things you can do? Well, you can buy all the match programmes. So, so, so basically, if that January to uh, April 65 thing, uh, there's only a couple of scenes in it where they're actually at a match, there's a semi-final and, and the final, and brought back was six. And it was quite funny because the actors found that difficult because I thought that'd be the easiest thing to do. 
you know, act as if you're watching a football mm-hmm. match. Because mm-hmm. if in doubt, shoot, get your finger out your ass or something like that. You know, but he said it's difficult commentating on something to an audience. And, you know, so then learn the lesson to say, we're going to do the next one. Six is too many scenes, we'll just do two. But the fact that, you know, you're buying this stuff on YouTube and the kind of play starts off, the, the first game featured is the Ibrox game uh, in the 1st of January 1965. Uh, and we lose 1-0 and Jimmy Johnson gets sent off in the first half by Tiny Wharton. And then we got a penalty with eight minutes to go and Bobby Murthy murder skies over the bar. So that, that's, that's, that's typical Celtic, basically. But do you think somebody went to the match with this programme? Mm-hmm. You know, so that gives you a sense of, you know, somebody was there with this program. It's not a replica. Somebody was there with it, and then you look through the program for wee ideas and adverts that are in it, or what people are saying, type of thing. You know, so that kind of inspires you to take more stuff. I've read all the books, etc. So, so basically, I've got, I've got a whole lot of the memory book at the kind of the evening citizen that night. You know, and these these are even times so they and these 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 papers come out kind of an hour of the game finishing. You know. A late different world, world, yeah. different world different altogether. World. Different world altogether. I always remember a funny story that I read about. And the olden days used to have pigeons, the old carrier pigeons, where, uh-huh. they would, where they would tie the match reports to, to the pigeons and then they would let them go. And there's a story about a guy at Tynecastle watching the Hearts Celtic game and, and Hearts are winning one, nothing a minute to go. And he ties his match to put the pigeon. And as the pigeon flies off, Celtic score, and he shoots the pigeon, Celtic have just scored! <laughs> <laughs> so, so, memorabilia. Uh, very important in terms of getting wee details because some of the stuff actually it's all about wee details, isn't it? But small details. That's the that's the Select Support Association handbook for that year. Uh, and then here there's an advert for the Shakespeare bar. You know, so after after speaking to Jim Divers, you know, there's and it's also the, all the old bars in Glasgow. Heritage is there's an advert for Heritage. There's a picture of John Clark dancing in this, you know, so quite quite bizarre. And the thing about the sixty five uh, period uh, was that Celtic are a big team because of Lisbon. Pure and simple because of Lisbon. You know, we talk about the fairy tale of the club. Yeah, it's yeah. Lisbon. Because in 97, 98, uh, they're about to do the 10. They're going to break the Lisbon Lions record. This is bad. Because our expectations were Celtic are a big club. 30 years ago, we won the European Cup. 30 years ago, we were consistently in the latter stages of European competition. 30 years ago, we won nine in a row. And look at us now. This is terrible. But in 65, they weren't a big club. They were as, as big as Hibs are now. See, they won the league twice in 30 years. Right, so, and I didn't mean this to happen, but then brought back. We had the one leading ten years, nine years, and this one is we had one leading twelve years. Yeah. So an interesting thing about brought back. A number of people said to me, I took my my daughter, son to the play, who was like, there like seventeen, eighteen, couldn't understand it. Couldn't understand why Rangers were this dominant team and Celtic were rubbish. Mm-hmm. Couldn't understand that at all. So you get back to sixty five, and there's a there's a big monologue of one of the characters in the play. Talking to his son about, about, about this because all we had was the six in a row team from the early 1900s, and even the old character in this play, he was too young to remember that. So there's nothing, mm-hmm. there's the old exhibition cup and stuff like that. And there was a 7 1 game in 57, which people dined out on, but there was really nothing, nothing at all until Bertie came back, until jo- until Jockstein came back. And there's a great because I've, I've read all the books of all the players of. of of that year, of that year, big yogi, Charlie Gallagher. And there's a great quote in uh, John Fallon's book uh, when he talks about Celtic players, Celtic fans had a bit of a slave mentality when it came to Rangers, if it's okay to say that. Because basically, you know, we're, we're never going to be near them. That was it finished. Uh, Bertie comes in the January there and plays a huge part in that cup run. And that's mm-hmm. why it was going to be called Ben and Bertie because virtually every round, when you read the papers back then, mm-hmm. he's the star man. Yeah. Then you get to the final and he scores two of the goals yeah. in the final. So he was pretty much the kind of main guy. And then the thing I said to Des before is that thank goodness things like social media weren't there in 1965. Because when Jock Steen comes in, they, they, it wasn't very good. You know, <laughs> you and, they, Twitter and, back then. and they'd have, oh, and they'd, and they'd have slaughtered. And what I like to they do. They would have slaughtered everybody. They would have slaughtered everyone. You know, and, and that's in the play as well. Six, who's this? You know, I mean, remember, remember, imagine that Hibs. Remember that the Sunday mail, the, the wee phone and the wee letter, somebody was saying we should swap Larson for Chick Charlie now. Aye. You know, remember, you know, so imagine Twitter was it. Oh, and the thing, wow. and, and, and what, I, what I think people like about the plays that I've written so far is they're, is they're different from other plays in terms of. I'm not saying other plays aren't good, they're, they're all really good, but you go to plays and they'll say, Well, I remember Jimmy Johnson, and people start clapping. You junkie, and they maybe start singing. <laughs> and what I was keen was to avoid all that at all, and and and, and have a go at the, the players because one of the early things that Brattvac and Tam says, you know, 
that we Fanny Larson and basically and football fans you tend to you know you don't back down you double down with this stuff you know if I don't think he's a good player he's not a good player he's supposed to go ah but he's still a wee fan as far as I'm concerned and people know. were saying that back when Larson started as well aye, oh, aye. so, so aye. You know, and then the bit like I said to you before the previous podcast that the second game of that season beat the the great burn of Fairland, and that's and that's the, the, the worst atmosphere I've ever had at Celtic Park. The booing at the end of that game, mm-hmm. you know, last season, last season, get, 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 and that's in the play as well, you know. So, in the same way that Bertie's got a lot of that stuff as well, that you know, people aren't happy with players no. because basically, you go back to that time, Jimmy Johnson didn't play in the final, right? So, Johnson didn't, he didn't, he didn't uh, uh, think Johnson was, 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 was good enough or whatever to, to play in the final. If Johnson hadn't came, Billy May was off the Spurs. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's all these kind of sliding doors mm-hmm. stuff that if he didn't come back, all these things would have changed. And you know, in the two games before the final, we go to Falkirk and lose six two, and there's only four thousand people there. And the game before the final, the Thistle game, we play Thistle, and we lose two one at Parkhead, and there's ten thousand there. Now, obviously, the whole Kelly White thing where they maybe kind of understated the crowd, but ten thousand then ended yeah. as, 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 as a ten. So, so people are apathetic. They hadn't won anything in years. Uh, so winning the cup was a kind of big thing. What, what this play maybe lacks that Bratback had was the sheer terror of not winning <laughs> the league. Whereas if he didn't win the Scottish Cup, well, it'd be no big deal because it's just the usual. So it has to be something else in the play mm-hmm. to give that kind of attention. Because the things that I've learned in the short time I've done the play thing is it's all about raising the stakes. Because if the stakes aren't really high, then the audience don't care. You know, So they have to really care that something's going to happen. And if they don't care something's going to happen, then they're not that bored. So... So the Scottish Cup is a big thing as well, and, and, and we kind of play that as a big, big thing. But there's another story that runs alongside that that's a big thing as well to try and keep the stakes high. Des, we were talking there about, you know, Billy McNeil might have left the club. Jimmy Johnson wasn't getting a game. Mm-hmm. You know, he was turned out for the reserves the night that the two Brazilian played uh, as trialists for the reserve team yeah. against Motherwell. Bobby Lennox almost joined Falkirk on a free transfer, <laughs> right? It's just absurd. But Bertie Old was allowed to leave. And before he left, because he was he was deemed to be a rapscallion and he ended up going down to Birmingham, but before he left, he almost made that 7-1 team. A lot of Celtic fans don't realise he played every round and except it, the final. Well, that's mentioned as well, isn't it? You know, the, the fact that, yeah. I, I mean, how could that happen? Yeah, there's so many ifs, buts, maybe sliding doors, as you say. And that's another thing. And it, and it, But they got, at that time... Decent money, well, at that time for old as well. So mm. I just, I mean, I, I just love all those potential sliding doors. Stuff. I know. I, I wrote a play at Newcastle plug, uh, and there's a guy who played for Newcastle called John McNamee, centre half, played for Celtic, and he's building his understudy, and he went out to Newcastle, and you think, well, what if Mayo had been sold, and what if John McNamee then gets a game, and what if Jopstein comes, what if when you've been cut, John McNamee is the guy <laughs> who wins the European Cup, it's no building McNeil. You know, you think all these wee if buts and maybe, and that's what makes football fascinating. I think. Oh, noticed. definitely. You, you know, when you're you're talking to someone like Bertie Old and you're explaining that we're actually going to put this this show on mm-hmm. and, and, and it's called Bend It Like Bertie, what's his reaction, Jim? Loved it. Loved it, yeah. He did love it. And when I, when I was speaking to uh, Robert, his son, about it, he says well, he'll be there on the first night and he'll love it and he'll come back and he'll enjoy it. Because the funny thing was... He was the first person when I was in Vegas. He's mentioned Vegas again. Hello. And uh, he came up to me. He was the first person. And he, and he said, that, that, that shot, it was magnificent last night. That was magnificent. And he loved the voices. He loved all the impersonations. He loved the So he, he, he really loved that. And I think, well, hopefully, <laughs> we'll love this um, as well. So as his son Robert true. said, he, he, loves, he loves entertainment. He loves... And he, he loves telling her the, the gags and being up there, you know, as, as the performer anyway. So he, I'm sure he will love this. Um, and yeah, he's, he's over the moon about it. Well, the, the, the kind of plan was to try, as I said earlier, to try and get as many of the surviving players mm-hmm. to come along. If they can't come along, maybe some of the relatives maybe to, to come along. And, and the idea basically is the night that Bertie comes, at the, the, obviously at the end of it, Bertie takes a bow at the end, you know. And it'd be great to see Bertie just, just Aye, I'm sure he will be. applauding. Something I meant, <laughs> I always thought when we're on here, finally uh, plugging this, you know, uh, promoting it on here. And remember, we used to have this conversation. This shows you how bad a season we had last year, right? <laughs> we used to go, right? <laughs> you, now, this was 18 months ago, roughly about 18 months ago, we did the, the podcast. Yes. It, it wasn't in here, it was just a podcast like on Zoom back in the early days when you were 
you're just doing the audio podcast. And I was telling you about this and you were laughing away saying, oh, it sounds great. And that's when we, I think that was the first time we, we'd mentioned it in public. And then we used to say, right, we're going to go on to Axom, the next big, the next big feel good moment. That's what it was, right? <laughs> and right. Oh no. And then, right, right, Scott's got a final. What can go wrong? We're a penalty away if you're losing to a team at a division below us. Right, because that's not exactly a feel right, right, the next one, feel good. Oh, we've got Ross County Park here. <laughs> Right, yeah. so that shows you that we there was never a feel good moment to promote this. I know there was never a feel good moment, and then all right, you know what? Right, what else can happen? What right? What if they take them to, to Dubai? <laughs> They're not going to take the team to Dubai during a pandemic. <laughs> and what if they take the friends guy who's on crutches? No, that's just <laughs> stupid. That's just too far fetched. All right, okay. So that so that's how long this feel good moment plug get put off. That just shows you how bad last season was. Oh, we, we we never got that feel good moment. We ever. didn't. We didn't. Now days we get a one one draw. The Champions League qualifier, that's the best I've felt in a long time being a Celtic fan. Yeah. But one thing I've got to share with you, and you may be aware of this, that leading up to our podcast, when we spoke 18 months ago or so, mm -hmm. Jim constantly sent me videos of Des McLean. And he was saying, you've got to watch this, you've got to watch this. Jim, you remember you did it yeah. and you, mm -hmm. you would WhatsApp them to me and everything. Uh, Jim, what's it been like so far working with this man to your right? Magnificent. <laughs> no, I mean, well, Des, I mean, Des has been really good over. I mean, you're out every day walking, right? Mm -hmm. Really disciplined, and I've been the opposite. I'm on the Lee Griffiths diet these days. But he's out every day, and at least maybe once or twice a week, you've thrown this. And maybe half the conversation is about Celtic. Mm -hmm. Always. Maybe Axel meeting. And then the other half is about the play and um, what we're going to do. And and to have somebody, you know, I mean, Billy Connolly's favourite stand up comedian is he, is he, is he, is he actual quote here. Yeah. And you will never get anyone who can impersonate Billy Connolly. Like this man can. Uh, there's a guy called Des McLean, he's brilliant. The, have you, I don't know if you've seen the, the, the Axom thing, a Celtic state of mind, it's brilliant. Um, no, uh, I've told this story many times, and uh, when, when I wound up Sean Connery, Sir Sean Connery, I said that on the, the podcast, our wee podcast, a great story, yeah. for, uh, for the ones who maybe not have heard it, um, <laughs> it, was a, it was a bank holiday Monday and we couldn't get anywhere we couldn't get anywhere opened uh, like, like to, and it, when I used to do the phone calls on, on Radio Clyde myself and George Bowie George Bowie would always kind of come up with these crazy far-fetched ideas and I'm saying George you, you're off your head it's not gonna, how, how can that who, who would believe that like just try it try it Des try it funny man try it funny man and I, I'm like okay I had my jacket on I went we're going to phone Sean Connery and he's in he's in where I say Waterstones, and I have to say I'm Billy Connolly. Oh, don't be stupid. He's going to have an entourage there. And I phoned up and I'm looking to speak to, to Sean Connery. It's Billy Connolly here. It's brilliant. <laughs> oh, my God. And this one we went in a very, very bad Edinburgh accent. She went, there's now Sean Connery here. Goodbye. And she just put the, the phone down. I says, told you. I says, we're never going to get near him. Are you kidding? So I went in the car, and I was driving at the car park of Radio Clyde, and I went, and... George came out and went bang, 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 bang on the windscreen. This is what he went. Sean Connery's on the phone. Sean Connery's on the phone. He's looking for Billy Connolly. Well, he's looking for you. He says, but, but going in. He went, Des, this is going to be this is going to be Sony Award winning stuff. I says, but we won't get permission. No, no, let me worry about that. I'll be fine. I'm going to put the headphones on. Everybody's all gathered round on air, record. I went, come on, hurry up. I went, oh, how the devil are you? And this voice went, Billy, 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 how are you? <laughs> And I just went, I don't know why, I went, ba da da dum ba da dum ba ba da 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 We were expecting you, ya. And I says, yeah, F's you, right? And, and they're like, don't swear, don't swear. This is comedy gold. Come on, don't. And I, I knew we weren't going to get permission, so I, I'm trying to get him off the phone. I kept swearing. And then he's like that, you know, I've, I've just done a, a book signing here, you know, in, in, in Weatherstones, that's what he called it, Weatherstones, right? <laughs> and he went, you know, and they're all sold out. Do, do you want to meet? You know, we can maybe go to the Scotsman Hotel, you know. And, and, and I went, why don't we meet halfway at Hart Hill Service Station, <laughs> you and madman, you <laughs> away you go, you fucking nutter. This is a, a wee ball bag for the Bryson's called James Bond, you know. <laughs> you know, the, you know, the, the guy who oh, and, and, and he's laughing away, and they're all going, Oh, he's got no sense of humor, no sense of humor, don't cut him on. And <laughs> yeah, good stuff, Billy. Oh, you're in good form today, <laughs> right? And then, and then. And then the next morning, I'm driving to Clyde. I was late that morning. I don't know why. And then 8.10, I mean, the call's not going out. Of course it's not going out. And all you heard was George Bobby going, today, Des McLean is licensed to thrill. Do, 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 do. And I went, oh, no. And the call went out. And it was just... 
emails come in, the tributes are pouring in, everybody loved it, you know, and I was like, oh no, and every time I seen a guy coming in, where I didn't even realise the suit, I went, oh, that would be, be his lawyers, oh, that would be a guy from Ofcom, oh no, and an, an email came in, that right, and for two two weeks with mine, nothing happened, I thought, maybe Sean Connery doesn't listen to your breakfast show in the morning, right, <laughs> and then I was down at Celtic Park, I was I was holding a big check up uh, at the centre circles. What is it? I mean, Des McLean, great, you know, walking out for cash for kids, fifty grand from Celtic. Thank you. I walk back to my seat. I go to sit down. Who's standing there where I was sitting? Not letting me sit down, and he just you know the, the hair, Billy Conley, and he went, McLean, yeah, wee fucker. <laughs> <laughs> see, I can say that because it's poetry when Billy says it's not swearing, is it? Billy could no, Billy no. could be say Billy could be in chapel. How you doing, you wee fucker to the priest? <laughs> and he wouldn't be like swearing because it's poetry. So Billy went, McLean, you wee he went and I went, is this about aye, it's about that poor old bastard <laughs> on the phone for half an hour. It was 29 <laughs> minutes with, with James Bond. He went, he still th he thought it was me. You're very cruel, cruel, cruel wee fucker. <laughs> and then I went, Billy, I didn't want to do it. They made me do it. They made me do it. And he, right, and he turned around and he went, I went, it was just a laugh, Billy. It was just a laugh. Forgive me. And he went, just a laugh. It was fucking brilliant. <laughs> and gave me a big hug. And I thought, there you go. There you go. That's something I can tell my grandmains about. So that was, I thought he was going to ban Jomi, but that was, that was brilliant. So uh, the Connolly and Connery one was awesome. But for Connolly to turn around and say that, and then later on, he's like, oh my God, one of my favourite. And you're like, oh, here we go. So, uh, and then for Betty Ogg to say you were magnificent, then that was, that was, that was, that was a review and a half. A review and a half. Mr. McLean, there it is. No, he's, he's, he's been great. But the thing is, the whole, the whole COVID, the whole lockdown thing from our first conversation, to earn many, many conversations. I mean, we'd, we'd be on the, I keep calling him Jim, the the, the live pod. You know, he just talk, he just talks, or we both talk, you know, for a good, you know, 20 minutes in, I butt in for about 20. And uh, we have, we spoke about, but the laugh was, I says, when we're on that, with that feel good moment never, never ever came. came. It never ever came. When could you celebrate this? That last that season. It speaks volumes. That speaks it volumes. does speak volumes, doesn't it? Now, looking at your career, mm -hmm. live comedy shows, yeah. TV, Radio, yeah. Um, you've obviously taken to dial ins and Zoom, etc. Where does theatre rank for you in terms of the challenges that that, that brings? I remember, uh, <laughs> look, when you're up there doing stand up, uh, then only I know the script. Mm -hmm. You can't turn and go, oh, He's forgot that, but he's <laughs> forgot that. You don't know, nobody knows. So that's the beauty. And actors will always say, how can you go up there without a script? There's no safety net. And I'm like, no, that's the beauty. I, I, you know, because only I know. So I am, you know, creating my own script as we go along, right? And uh, I remember when I was playing Tommy Sheridan and I, Tommy, at the King's Theatre. And uh, I just thought, you're going out there as somebody else, you know. And that was amazing. That, that theatre, it is sc that's scary. That's when you get the old butterflies again. And, and uh, what I remember is when Colin McCready... Uh, of tag up fame, you know, and stuff like that. They, they were all like, they used to all say to me, "We're, you know, we're a, we're classically trained actors. What are you?" And I was like, "I've only done panto. I've only done comedy." I've only... But I remember uh, calling one night in the King's Theatre. I says, "What's wrong with you?" And he says, "Well, what happens if I get heckled?" I says, "You're not going to get heckled." When Ian Patterson wrote the play, comedy man, you're you're a comedian. They're, they're, you know, they're all going to be here comment. I says, "You're not going to get heckled in the King's Theatre, are you?" And then Colin walked out on the first night of I Tommy. And and it, and it, he would stand outside the big the big courtroom backdrop, and he would go brothers and sisters. And before he said could say brothers, somebody went, "There's been a murder." <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, there you go. We all knew that heckle was going. To, and then they all started. It was like Spartacus. There's been a murder. There's been a murder. There's been a murder. There's been a murder. And I was telling people to say, "There's been a murder." No, <laughs> uh, the theatre thing is it's amazing. It's. Uh, as Laurie said earlier on, uh, scary. It's just because you know you've got to play. You're playing this man, Celtic. You know, uh, a lot of Celtic fans and their football fans. Are, and you know, with a tough year, they want to come along and they want to enjoy something, don't they? You know. So, yes, it's it's challenging and it's uh, it's scary, but it's going to be great. This is going to be great. It's up there with the best things that that, that, that I've ever looked forward to. This, well, this is great. I was going to ask um, for you to repay. The favour and tell me about Jim, but it's up there with the, the best things he's looked forward to. Jim, that's some accolade. Tell us what should the audience expect from this play, and also tell us where to get the tickets and when it's happening. Okay, it's happening uh, the second to the fourth of September, and it's in the uh, Webster's Theatre, uh, Great Western Road in the West End of Glasgow. 
Uh, so for three nights, uh, Saturday nights almost sold out, I think, uh, and the other two nights are doing quite well. I mm -hmm. that last night, so they're doing quite well. What can they expect? Uh, as I said, it's not the Bertie Old story. Uh, it's a story about a, a middle-aged uh, female Celtic fan, uh, her elderly dad, uh, and they end up going through the journey uh, of January to April 1965, mm -hmm. uh, and what it's like to support Celtic. And it's another story that kind of runs along side that and and what i've kind of done again unintentionally uh, the kind of three f's that i've got and none of them is bad in terms of the story about ben brought back the facts with about that was the season basically and the fiction was about he's a fictional family and then there was some fantasy in it which i won't say that will spoil the brought back surprise and bertie's kind of the same it's the factual bit about the 65 cut run the fictional bit is about the family that's in that, mm -hmm. and then there's a fantasy bit as well. And much the same as brought back, when people see the fantasy bit, they'll say WTF, or whatever they say these days, because because it is out there, isn't it? It's, it's bonkers. Honestly, it's, it's, the reason that I, I have been looking forward to this so much, if you're a Celtic fan of any age, I'm not just saying this, you're going to love this. And it's, it's it is true. I mean, there's plenty of Bertie in it, there's plenty of me doing Bertie, and uh, they'll enjoy that. Uh, so, because one of the things was, so he's buttoning them again as usual. Was uh, we did brat back. Somebody was saying to me that after after ten minutes, there was two elderly women sitting in front of them, and they said, "What's this going to do with Celtic?" And then at the end of it, they were the first two to stand up and give it a stand ovation because there is bonkersy bits in there. We actually writing some of these bonkersy bits. You're thinking, "Well, people get this." And then we're to days, and he says, "Oh, it's brilliant." So I think, obviously, he gets it. Does it not set it apart though? There's a fact that it isn't just a chronology. He's adding a bit of fantasy. Absolutely of brilliant. Yeah. Also, I'm, I'm not going to... Magnificent. I'm magnificent. magnificent. I'm not going to lie here, right, when a, when a, a comedian... I'm used to writing all my own stuff and, and you know, and, and you know, either you go, oh, that works, that doesn't, this is good, this needs work, this will grow on stage, I'll add to that, that'll take that back away. But see when somebody else sends you something and, and you're like, oh, right, right, I'll, I'll decide if this is funny or not, right? And it is, it's non-stop. I'm telling him, writers are always a wee bit, you sure that's funny? A wee bit. And I'm like, it, it starts off really, really funny. And then it's just like bang, 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 bang. Loads of laughs. Really, And Brat Back was the same, really, really funny. But there's so much in this. It's packed right out. And once you go, you, obviously it starts off with Bertie and all that, me being Bertie. But then it does take you on a real journey. And it's a tribute to like like that, that amazing year, Celtic, Bertie, and the 60s, and right up to... Right up to date as well, but it really is. It's, it's got everything. Yeah, it it's a, a cracker. Bit, it jumps a bit. A wee bit. It does it's, jump a bit. It's like covered a few bases. Okay, I but I can't give too much away. But just no, just, just no. That's it. But it is. It's it's just, uh, just say magnificent in Bertie's voice again. That's what it does. It's magnificent, son. <laughs> magnificent, son. See, when we, we talk about Bertie Old and Jinky and Billy McNeil, you could go through that whole team. They're superheroes. Oh, absolutely yeah, yeah. superheroes oh. and obviously you meet your heroes from mm. time to time Des. Um you mentioned you just nonchalantly mentioned Mark Miller and the fact that he quoted Brat back in glowing terms how on earth did you get something like Mark Miller to belong <laughs> to a, a show called well, Bend It Like Brat Back James McInerney who's in the play as a, as a, as a pal of Mark's so he, I mean, James like Des knows everyone you know when you're in this when you're not part of the show business and you don't know anyone it's great to find people like James and days who've got all these kind of contacts to come along. So Mark came along and you know I'd, I'd heard of Mark Miller through Kickass and didn't know who he was and then there was a tweet that he tweeted. We actually we ended up going on to Janice Forsyth's radio uh, mm -hmm. after the radio show and you're thinking we're on Radio Scotland uh, and she was remotely from London so James and I were in the studio and it was her that said uh, Mark Miller said that Bratback was 20,000 leagues better than any other player in the genre and that's the first time I'd heard that and then I saw a tweet they put up and then you see he's got a hundred thousand followers and he's a guy but he's he's a kind of network vp so you're thinking i'll get my job description off to network tomorrow this is so to get something like that is just ridiculous and then we do the sec which is just ridiculous because i still think this is a daft but brat back was just a daft wee story i still think Bertie's like a daft wee story but in the hands of great actors it suddenly becomes a lot more and and even we things i mean we things that you're thinking i'm aren't very funny when an actor says that, there's a, there's a brilliant line brought back. Remember, that, 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 at the Dunfermline game, we've lost 2 1. And the main character, Tam's having a heart attack, he's stressed out. We've lost the first two games of the season. And he doesn't know what to say at the end of the game. He's just, 
and he says, like, up the effing road. And the place is going bonkers at this. Just that up the effing road. Because he's had enough. Life is just, the, yeah. and that's the phrase. And, it, and in no way, shape, or form did I think up the effing road would get a laugh. But it gets a huge laugh. So, and there's another line which I'm not going to tell you that's in Bertie. And, the, and it's just two words. And the two words at the end of this monologue are just so, so funny. When the actor says these two words, the place will just go bonkers. And it's just yeah. two words. And it's, it's, it's brilliant. When you actually get something like that, you've written something down and then, and then he then reads it out and you realise it's actually a lot funnier than I thought it was. And I think, I mean, actors are incredible. I mean, what, what I have, I've, I've learned in a relatively short time is how skillful actors are. And Laurie Vance said, you know, brought back one of those challenges they've ever done. I had, I had 90 pages and he was on 84 of the pages. Mm. And he also directed that. And he was the central character. So it wasn't like he's in the background wondering what's happening. He's up front there. You have to learn 84 lines, 84 pages of lines you're up there, and the spotlight is blinding because I was on the stage shifting. So it's blinding, eighty-four lines, and there was nights where because I'm in a, I'm in with a technician. I've got a laptop and I'm and I'm putting in scenes and, and I'm blowing a whistle and stuff. Like this is real pressure. Blowing a whistle at half time of, of games and stuff like this. And you know how difficult it is. And there was one night where, let's see who the actor was, missed a whole page. Now like this, the audience would have known they'd missed a whole page. No, they didn't missed a whole page. <clears throat> and there were two or three really funny jokes in this page. Oh, I missed that page, but fortunately it wasn't. I mean, part of the story. So it wasn't like, you know, you missed the people sort of thing. Who did that? Come mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so you realise that and then I wound the person up. You missed a, I uh, know I missed a page and got it back so quickly, you know. And what, what the actors were saying is that a lot of acting is actually reacting. So you're reacting to someone. Somebody mm -hmm. says that, you say that yeah. type of thing. And then there's another bit where somebody said the wrong line. They, they sort of missed 10 lines, say. But, but I wouldn't say it was, it was, it was quick enough to then go back because it was like, Almost like saying you only meant to say that, you meant to say this. So I'll say this, and you've got to react to that. So that's that's been fascinating watching watching that at play and how that thing works. And just and you just realise how skilled people could because I could never do that. You know, it takes me all my time to kind of memorise a few lines of something to actually do 84 pages in the spotlight. So and I'm watching this because I've written it thinking, I think he's gonna forget the line. Mm. And, he, and the, the, the the funniest one was was uh, we feature two we feature four Rangers games in Brat back of, of that season. And you remember Stubbs equalises uh, in injury time. And then there's a New Year's game and it's a uh, Burley and Lambert score. So it's one that you mix them up. Right? And it was like a uh, minute to go. Did not be goes, Lambert, you're yeah, beauty. And it's Stubbs, you know. So you're thinking, oh. So people in the audience obviously knew who are Celtic fans knew. I said mm -hmm. the wrong thing. But if you want a Celtic fan, it, it's, it's just a name. Somebody scored a goal. So you're acutely aware of that. If you've written it and worked the right, you know, just just take the right names at the right time. But the punchline of my story is that I, I'm just in total in awe of actors and how they can actually memorise all these lines. Uh, what's what's okay about this one? This is a rehearsed reading, therefore they'll have the scripts. You know, whether they choose to use them or not, sometimes they'll use them, sometimes they won't. But you will not after after five minutes, you will not notice that they've got the scripts in their hands, and that means that it's less pressure for me to watch it. Do you have plans, Jim, like you did with Bratback and how that developed for? I think, I think we have, stage. We, we have it's going to plans. Vegas. It's going to Vegas. Well, we'll oh, see. Outstanding. We'll see. I think. Uh, I think. I'm quite happy for anything to happen. I think uh, this is the main man. This man's very much in demand. Uh, if if, if Des fancies touring it around Scotland, that's what we'll do. Uh, I was in talks with the guy uh, who runs the Vegas convention. Had to be cancelled this year about brought back and and the, along with a huge disappointment of actually losing the ten. Putting a play on about stopping the 10 mm. is maybe not the most popular thing Bad to do timing. at the yeah. moment. Although it's the 25th anniversary in a couple of years' time, maybe things will have died down then. So is that not scary, 25th anniversary? Well, it's 23 oh, years ago. No, you, you think when you think 25, you're thinking the Lisbon Lions and all that. We're talking about stopping the 10. Right, so, so I think uh, to answer the question uh, for once, uh, it's up to days. If, we, if if there's up for touring it, then we certainly tour it. And, and, and Vegas, because we're having spoken to the guys who are in Vegas and talking about Brat back, they were saying, this week you're doing well because it's different. Mm. Because I think a lot of what happens, in, I've never been to the Vegas convention, but a lot of happens, it's maybe stand-up comedy, it's maybe musicians, it's yeah. maybe... Songs, yeah. maybe but also, uh, the reason that this would work, because somebody had mentioned to, uh, about it going to Vegas, is that Bertie was in Vegas all the time. Yeah. Bertie went to the Celtic convention all the time and he was the main man, he was up there with the mic. Aye. So this would be fitting for this to go to... Synonymous with Bertie. Of course it is, it is it? with Bertie yeah. in Vegas. And as you said earlier on, you can see Bertie sitting... You know, in Vegas with Joe Pitch, you know that. Hey, what are you saying, son? Sit down. 
you know, so uh, I, yeah, it's just me. And he, I think that's why he loved all that in Vegas, you know, because because barely, you know, the, the spotlight and all that. So, all right, it would work. Okay, let's go to Vegas. Let's do let's it. Vegas. You heard it here first, but on Axon, we'll continually keep you updated with the developments of Bender Like Bertie. Buy your tickets. On the link below, all that's left for me to say is Jim or Des McLean. Thanks once again for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind. Thanks, Paul. Thank you.